Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for gathering us here to worship you, to praise you, to lift up your name in gratitude. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you that it cleanses us and heals us, not only from sin, but it helps transform our minds to be like the mind of your Son, the mind of Christ. And Lord, how many great things you have done for us as we count our blessings over the year. Lord, it's been uh, an amazing year. And there, every year has its own struggles, and yet, God, we see your provision over and over and over again. God, I pray as we uh, launch into another year that we'll be eager to see your blessings, we'll be eager to find the ways in which we can lift up your name to our neighbors, to our family, to our friends, that we'll be eager to be about our purpose, which is to spread your word. Father, that we will be bold and zealous, and God, that we will not be ashamed, and that we will study to show ourselves approved unto you, and that we will always be prepared to give an answer to those who ask the reason for the hope that we have. God, that your word will surface upon our lips, and that you'll give us the words to speak in the hour that we need them. Father, that we'll walk according to your spirit, for we know that when we walk in your spirit, there is no condemnation. Father, we love you, we lift you up, we praise you, we give you all the glory, Father, for everything, for every good thing and pleasing thing comes from you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been on a journey... Uh, whether you know it or not, here at Acorn. And the journey is to uh, get the flavor of the early church. It's to embrace an idea of what church should look like, not based on what we've lived out here in the current generation, but what church looked like when it launched, as is told in the book of Acts. And we've been walking through that journey a little bit and learning different things along the way. But one of the things we see right off the gate is that the apostles are bold. They are incredibly fearless. And that even when told and arrested time and time again to stop preaching in the name of Jesus, they take no heed to those words. And they come from powerful people. They come from people in authority and, and people that have the power to arrest them. And yet they do not let fear creep in to the point of letting them stop preaching. One of the other interesting things as we've seen is that it's not that they're leading a rebellion. In a way they are, but it's not they're leading a, a typical type of rebellion and with, they're resisting all authority. It's not like when they get arrested that they try to resist arrest. It's not like they fight the guards. They surrender to their punishment. They praise God even that they are persecuted for the name. But when it comes to their tongue, they do not surrender. They may surrender when it comes to actions. They may let guards come and put them in prisons. But when it comes to their voice, or when it comes to preaching the gospel, or when it comes to lifting up the name of Jesus, when it comes to telling the story that Jesus died and rose again, and that there will be a judgment, when it comes to calling all men to repent and be baptized in the name of that wonderful name of Jesus, and that there's a Holy Spirit, they don't refrain. They, they do not allow anyone to stop them from preaching the gospel. And so this keeps getting them in trouble. And we uh, left off in Acts chapter 5, and that's where they uh, got arrested again. And it says all the apostles uh, were arrested. The last time I preached from Acts 5, we left off with all the apostles arrested and told to stop preaching in Jesus' name. But an angel broke them out of jail and told them to go back and preach some more on the Temple Mount right back where they started from. That's, that's amazing to me that you, you find them uh, going exactly in opposition to what their religious leadership has told them. True Christianity does not cower under threat. It does not crumble under oppression. True Christianity is as bold as a lion and yet as peaceful as a dove. It does not compromise to sin nor tolerate evil. Yet it knows when to be merciful and forgive. True Christianity is composed of the broken made whole. Sinners made saints. 
lost people that are found, those once blind who now see. True Christianity is the gathering of the transformed. In the beginning, Christianity was a movement that made the Temple Mount crowded with thousands of people every day that wanted to learn more about Jesus and taste and see that he is good. Christianity was not a building with a cemetery next door. It was a driving force, a growing crowd, and it was alive. Think about it. Jesus' biggest crowd was feeding the 5,000. This crowd of followers in the early church was likely double or more than that. And they were committed, not questioning. They were unified, of one mind, convinced. This great crowd of people that would gather every day on the Temple Mount and not in the outskirts of Galilee on some gray field. These people were gathering together to hear about and believe in and participate in the things that Jesus has taught and commanded right smack dab in the center city, in the capital, in front of everybody. And the place was overflowing, not 5,000, likely 10,000, maybe 15. Some commentators even estimate it might have been 20,000 people gathering every day and we know on the day of Pentecost 3,000 were baptized and we know from the later chapters that we've looked in in Acts that 5,000 were baptized and so we're dealing with a massive movement church was a movement it wasn't contained in the walls it couldn't be contained in the walls and it was exploding they thought they had problems with Jesus and they crucified him but now that the church was in full motion the problems they had with Jesus seem small and pale in comparison to the problems they're now having with these apostles Amen. in the movement of Christ. That's the church of the first century. You know, Jesus said that when I leave, you'll do greater miracles than me. Already we're seeing, and some of us don't realize, that this itself is a greater miracle. Sure, there's the, the small miracles of the healing of the lame man with Peter and John and, and, the, and the miracles that we're going to go through as we continue on this journey in Acts. We're going to see a lot of amazing miracles. But I want you not to neglect to see the miracle right now of the formation of the church. That it's not 5,000 people looking for bread, miraculous bread and, and, and manna from heaven, from Jesus. It's not the 5,000 that are questioning Jesus, who in John chapter 6 immediately leave him because he starts talking about the blood and body. And it says that many left him that day. They were a fickle crowd. This is not a fickle crowd. These are committed people. They're disciples of Christ who've been baptized in His name, who recognize His rec uh, resurrection, who are ready to go forth and preach the gospel. And there's thousands of them. And it's a problem. It's a problem for the city managers and the Sanhedrin and the council and the people in authority. They don't know what to do. It's overwhelming. They're overwhelming their temple mount, the Jewish place of worship. The place that they understand is the place that they're supposed to obey God is being overwhelmed by Christians. Talk about revival. There's a revival going on in Jerusalem. And it started on the day of Pentecost and it just keeps, seems to multiply. And they try their best to, to stop it. They arrest the leaders. And they find out the leaders, man, they're just ordinary and simple people. These guys are unschooled. But they've spent time with Jesus. The only thing that we can mark that makes them distinct is that they've spent time with Jesus. What are we going to do with these guys? And so they've arrested the apostles. And they've got him. And we come to this passage. Killing Jesus didn't stop the movement. It grew. Killing the apostles when they're just ordinary and unschooled people would not threaten the movement. It might even enlarge it. Church is the gathering of people who have been called out. Literally, ecclesia. It's a called out gathering. It's, it, it's what it means in Greek. It's not limited to the word church. It, it, it's a broad word that has to do with 
calling out elected ones for a specific cause and meeting. What are they called out from? What were these people called out from? I know what I was called out from. I was called out from lies. I was called out from stealing, deception, cheating, deceit, murderous thoughts, anger, fear, doubt. I feel very called out from many of the things that, uh, that Christ promises when you come to Him. What were you called out from? You know, some might say I was called out from alcohol. Some say I might, might have been called out from fornication or prostitution or drugs. Or I was called out from, from being a liar and a cheater, or a thief, a robber. Or I was called out from being completely selfish and self-centered. Because when you come to Christ, you repent, you change. You know, I think about New Year's and I'm like, man, New Year's is amazing because every time we come to New Year's, people of the secular world say, I want to make a New Year's resolution. They want to change. They want to do something new. Okay? And I'm thinking, you know, in Christ, I can do that every day. Wow, sure. I don't need a new year. Because He empowers you through the power of the Holy Spirit to actually change. How many people make these resolutions and then two months in, three months in, they're right back where they were. It's as if the passage where Jesus says, you cast out a demon and if you wipe the place clean and, and, and the unfortunate situation is if you don't fill the place with something, seven more demons will come in and it'll be worse off than it began. That's the life of humanity. We see this every year, you know. I'm going to lose 50 pounds. I'm going to stop eating candy bars. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to visit my mom more. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And we make all these promises. And how many get fulfilled? Because if you were a disciplined person, you wouldn't need New Year's to make such a fulfillment. It would be part of your nature. There's no special nature change because we had a year change. But when Christ... Spirit comes to live in you. There is a nature change. You are a new birth. You are a new beginning. You are born again. And your nature is no longer the sinful nature of the flesh. It becomes a new nature in Christ. And so one of the great mysteries of this empowerment that, that the religious leaders weren't tapping into is that when they were dealing with these apostles, they weren't factoring in the fact that they were not operating in the strength of men. They weren't operating in the strength of Peter the fisherman or Matthew the tax collector. They were operating in the power of the Holy Spirit which was resident in them. And Jesus had said, unless I go to the Father, unless this happens, then the Spirit cannot come to you. But when I go, I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you unempowered. You will be equipped. And the Holy Spirit will be in you. And so what's the magic? Was it a title? Was it they spent three years with Christ? Where, was it because they were apostles? No. No. What made all the difference is they had the Holy Spirit in them. The Holy Spirit equips you to repent. Yeah, it's amazing, the Holy Spirit. I mean, I think of my life, and it's a process of what they call in theology sanctification, which means the Holy Spirit makes you holy. From sinner to saint. And for some things, it's instant. Man, I think of my early steps towards Christ. Some things changed immediately. Some things I wasn't even aware of that needed to change, and he had to mature me enough so that I could begin to look in the mirror enough to see that these things need to change too. But fortunately, he did not leave me unequipped for the change. Because I can't change in my own strength. Your own strength changing is why you go back to it again Temporary change. You go and you repeat the same flaws of character over and over and over again. Because every man and woman is either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. And the only way to be a slave to righteousness is to have the Holy Spirit resident within you. Here in this passage in Acts that we're going to pick up in is uh, interesting when the apostles are asked to stop preaching in this name and they're reminded that they had even been told to stop preaching in the name. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 32, it says, We are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. Okay. You know, a lot of people don't like to talk about obedience. But I'm telling you what, unless you are submitted to the Holy Spirit, 
then you're quenching it or don't have it. And so the Holy Spirit is resident with those who obey Him. It's a complete, when we say Jesus is Lord, that means Master. Jesus is controlling your decisions, influencing everything you do. I think it might be a magical, uh, entrancing question to ask random people when you're in the grocery store or wherever you are to drum up enough boldness to be wild and crazy enough to walk up to some stranger and say, hey, is Jesus your Lord? Uh -oh. Just start, boom, and see how people react. My Lord, who knows what you'll get? Maybe they'll say yes. Maybe they'll say stumble or maybe they'll get mad at you. But wow, wow, that would be an interesting revolution if we started practicing such boldness in the community that we live in. So here they were in, in, in this meeting and, and there's, there's frustration in the council. And the council of the Sanhedrin is the Jewish leadership. It's composed of, uh, I believe, 60 members. And most of them uh, are either Pharisees or Sadducees. And most of you that have been around know the difference. The major difference between a Sadducee and a Pharisee is a Sadducee what? No angels, no resurrection, no afterlife, here and now. For the Pharisees, all of that is believable. Well, what just happened? These guys were imprisoned in locked cells. They went to retrieve them, and they're not there. They have been transported out of the jail, and doors have been opened and shut behind them, and they've been told what to do. Get back, right back where you started from, and preach this message. And so for the Sadducees, they should be asking the question, how did you get back out here? For the Pharisees, they might be scratching their head a little bit going, could it have been an angel? Because they're not wrestling with whether angels exist or not. So in this conversation we're going to have, we're going to talk about this guy named Gamaliel. And Gamaliel is a Pharisee. So he comes on the side that believes in resurrection and he believes in angels. And he's uh, actually, according to Jewish tradition, he's in leadership at the Sanhedrin. He is one of the major voices at this time. So if there was, and we're not too sure, but if there was a separation between leadership, maybe they had a Sadducee leader, maybe through the high priestship, and then one of the Pharisee leaders, Gamaliel likely would have been that guy. He, he, he made such a significant impact on Judaism that in their writings, the Mishnah and the Talmud, they quote him often, and they gave him a new title, uh, Rabban. Not Rabbi, but Rabban. And Rabban in these first centuries, this, this was, he was the first Rabban. And Rabban means literally our master. And they have a quote that, that is written among the Talmud and the scholars over and over again through the centuries. When Rabban Gamaliel died, the honor of the Torah failed and purity and Phariseeism died with him. So I'm just trying to convey to you that their respect for him was off the charts. And we have many quotes from another quote of, uh, of his is uh, brief and understandable. He says, secure a teacher for yourself. Secure a teacher for yourself. Gamaliel believed that no man uh, could just do it on his own. That he needed somebody to teach him. To develop him, to help him get to the place where maybe he could do some things on his own. But in the beginning, he needed a teacher. It reminds me of a few passages in the Bible. It reminds me of one and we're going to cover in a few, probably a couple months from now or a month from now. And it's this Ethiopian eunuch and he's traveling and, and he's reading the book of Isaiah and Philip a deacon who we're going to learn about next week, he comes running up to the, to, the, to the carriage where this Ethiopian eunuch is, and he's reading Isaiah, and he says, do you understand the words that you're reading? And the eunuch is humble enough to say, how can I unless 
I have a teacher. You know, it's amazing how many people don't want a teacher today. They don't want anybody in their life. They don't want any accountability. They don't want anybody to know them that closely. They think that they want nobody in their life because they believe that they could do it on themselves, by themselves, you know, better than they could with any kind of exterior input. But the reality of it is they're covering over so much failure and sin that they don't want anybody in their life because they don't want them to see the real mess that they're in. You know, Paul struggled uh, with this concept, or he did it with us uh, in his letters to the churches. One place he says, uh, for, he says to the Corinthians, he says, For though you have 10,000 teachers in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. You know, we never really have just one teacher when it comes to Christ or when it comes to life. There are many people that plant seeds in our life through the, through the years. There's sermons, there's Bible studies. Today there's, you know, things we read or books that we attend to or, or little clips from YouTube or different people that have stepped into our life different times and they've spoken to it. And we may have 10,000 teachers in our life, but we only have a few fathers. And Paul's saying, these are the people that were the intricate folks that were in your life that helped you make the leap from lost to saved in Christ Jesus. They didn't save you, but they were the intricate teachers or fathers in your life that helped bring you to the light. And Paul's saying this. He's saying, you know, to the Corinthians, ye had a lot of teachers, but when it comes down to the bottom line, folks, it was me, Paul says, in Christ Jesus that fathered you to this point. And he's trying to teach them some more. And they've closed their ears. He's trying to give them some more information, but they shut them down. They got to the point where they feel like they know enough that the rest of the journey is on their own. They're independent. And that's just never the way the church operated. Not in the book of Acts, not in its history, and it should not operate that way today. Paul goes at it again in his discussion to Timothy. And he says, you know, in the last days, men will heap to themselves teachers that will tickle their itching ears and tell them the things they want to hear because they can no longer endure sound doctrine. It means, basically, Paul's saying, in the last days, what will happen is people will select their own teachers and they'll get the ones that tell them exactly what they want to hear. It's not that they're getting the teachers that are going to challenge them. Them. It's not that they're getting the teachers that are going to hold them accountable. It's not that they're getting the teachers that are going to uphold the truth in their lives or help them change or embrace Christ or get the Holy Spirit tapped into. It's that they're going to get the teachers that make them feel comfy. And so Paul spells it all out to Timothy and says, Welcome to the last days, Timothy, where men will heap to themselves teachers that will make them feel comfy. Well, that wasn't Gamaliel. Gamaliel, who we'll find out, was Paul's teacher before Paul became a Christian. Gamaliel was serious about the fact that men needed somebody to disciple them. The Bible uh, tells us that he breaks forth this meeting with some interesting wisdom. Gamaliel was wrestling with some stuff from his pharisaical side, and it had to do with this temple situation. Some of us think that the Herod's temple was... Uh, the second temple. Matter of fact, a lot of times it's called the second temple. And, and, and what that means is there was the temple back in Solomon's day. It got destroyed during the Babylonian captivity. And then they came out of captivity and they built the second temple. Well, in reality, the second temple was built by a guy named Zerubbabel. Okay? But when Herod gets on the scene, Herod decides he wants to build another temple. And so whatever was constructed with Zerubbabel was displaced, reinvented, twisted. The proportions of the temple even don't match up to anything biblical. Herod's temple, the one that stood in Jesus' day, was very different than what the Bible prescribes. And this bothered Gamaliel. A matter of fact, in the writings of the Jews, it says whenever they spoke of Zerubbabel's temple, they would talk of the sacrifice of a ram as a burnt offering for sin. But whenever they spoke of Herod's temple, they would sacrifice a goat as an offering for sin. 
And so there's an uh, embedded rabbinic fight going on that a lot of people don't realize. Uh, but Gamaliel was on the side of, I don't really like what Herod's doing. And so a lot of the writings of Gamaliel and the things that we hint to in his understanding is he was trying to figure out how can Jews live out their faith without the temple? How can Jews live out their faith without the sacrifice? How can Jews live out their faith without a king? And how can Jews live out their faith without a high priest? Because remember, the high priest was on the Sadducee side. And so already Gamaliel was disenchanted with a lot of the current structure of his religion. And he was searching deep in his soul to try to figure out the truth. And he was, a, he was a, in sorts, he was uh, not so stuck in tradition or popular opinion. He was curious and confident that God would win even man's religion. Over man's religion. He, he was not so stuck in his tradition and his religion that he felt like God couldn't supersede it. Yeah. And that, that, that's noble character right there. There's a little bit of noble character right there. And so when it comes to these guys and they gather them together, he is the one who stands up. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 34, Then a Pharisee stood up in the Sanhedrin named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, honored by all the people, and commanded to put the apostles outside for a little way. He calls them in and says, Set them outside. I want to talk to you, ever, everybody, for a moment. So they put the apostles outside, and he said to them, You men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do touching these men. Watch out how you treat these guys. Paul, in his testimony in Acts chapter 22, verses 3 and 4, much later, and this is after a few years after this event, Paul was likely in this room as a young disciple of Gamaliel. Gamaliel's going to die. From what we understand in the Jewish tradition, Gamaliel's father was um, Shimei, Simeon. He's, he's, most Christians think he's the Simeon that waited for the constellation that wanted to hold the baby Jesus. They actually think that the, the Gamaliel's father was that Simeon, that same one that was holding the baby Jesus. And, and how did Gamaliel deal with that? His own dad probably believed that Jesus was, was the Messiah, or at least died believing that Jesus was the Messiah before Jesus went out to live and do the things that he did. And so those seeds were already planted there. And, and, and I'm just pausing for this little bit of a commercial to tell you that sometimes the seeds that you're planting, they take years to develop. And so his dad was that, but his dad, his grandfather was Hillel. And in the famous tradition of Judaism, there's Hillel and the Shammai. Hillel is the guy who's the righteous guy who stands up for the word all the time. And Shammai is the guy who's the strict guy who's like, man, black and white, this way, crack down on him. Hillel's the guy, let's find a little mercy, let's find a little grace. And so Gamaliel comes from this tradition of people who, who try to find the mercy of God. Which is interesting. It, it, it affected his character. And, and Paul says he schooled under this man. He says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. When Paul's giving this testimony, Gamaliel has already died. And I was disciplined according to the exactness of the Torah of the fathers and was zealous toward God as you are all this day. Paul's in the midst of his own trial at this point and people are trying to take his life or arrest him. And he's trying to tell him, hey, I'm like you. I was schooled under Gamaliel. I was schooled on one of the best. And I persecuted this way unto death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. The interesting thing about Paul's testimony is he did what Gamaliel wouldn't do. Gamaliel is quick to set them free. Gamaliel is quick to say, don't touch these men. If it's of God, it will last. And if you fight it, you'll find yourself fighting against God. If it's not of God then it will dissipate. It will fall away. It will be destructed. And he gives his examples of Judas and Judas. And he tells of last uh, cult leaders from his last generation who led groups of people with a zealous uh, perspective towards uh, resisting against the Romans. And these these cult leaders he names are also named in the book of Josephus and in the Jewish writings. And we know that, for instance, Theudas was, was this guy who believed he was a prophet. And he, he declared that because he was a prophet, that this was going to be the time of the overthrow of the Romans. And that, uh, you know, that he would go forth and he would lead them. And he led this group of 400 people down to the River Jordan in, in anticipation. He told them, because when I get down to the river, God will back my play and the river will part. And you'll see that I'm a prophet and you need to follow me and that's kind of something typical of cult leaders 
They're into having people follow them. He gets down to the river. The Romans meet him there. They take his head off. They send the head back to Jerusalem. The crowd dissipates. Okay, we know that from the book of Josephus. It's crazy. Judas, same kind of story. Judas comes out of the Qumran tribe where we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. He's anti-temple uh, anti establishment. He's anti-modern-day Jerusalem. And he's anti-Roman uh, facility. But his movement comes to nothing because it's his own agenda. He's after his own agenda. He's after his own reputation. He's after the things that concern him in his political moment. He's so sucked into his own generation that he can't see the clouds for this guy. He's too intertwined in the world. But these apostles are different. Peter could care less whether you know his name. Matter of fact, when you start showing him that he performed a miracle, he is quick to say, I didn't perform that miracle. He is very, very, very quick to say that if you are talking about this man who was once lame and how it is that he's walking, it's by no other name than the name of Jesus. And by that name, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. So Peter seems to be careless about his own reputation. He's no Judas. He's no Judas. And Gamaliel's registering all this. And he tells them, you know, these guys were zealous in their day and they came to nothing. You know, I see it so much today. There are so many so-called Christians that are zealous for their own ministry. Their own ministry, their own TV show, they're zealous about their books, they're zealous about their methodology, their 12-step program. Whatever it is that they've developed, they're zealous about it. And yet the zeal of Christ is often lacking. Their own name and their own reputation become so important to them that they become powerless and ineffective and their movement fades to nothing. It ended up going nowhere. The next generation won't even remember them. It'll be gone. It won't be significant. It'll be the dust in the wind because they didn't build up Christ. It's funny. Those who are humbled will be exalted and those who are exalted will be humbled. Christian work to be humble. Christian work to be humble. Of all people that could have been exalted, Peter could have been exalted. The apostles could have been exalted, but they worked to be humble. Gamaliel is the one who in his day said we need to learn from the past or we're destined to repeat it. And that's what he does in his examples. He says, look at these past examples, guys. These past examples show us that if you react, I know what you want to do. You want to shred them. You want to kill them. You want to do to them what we did to Jesus. But if you react like that, and it's a movement of God, you are actually fighting God. You're not fighting them. And you may kill them. You may crucify them. You may stone them. You may bury their reputation. You may make their life miserable. But the fact is, you're not fighting them. You're fighting God. And if these guys are not who they claim to be, don't worry about it. Our God's bigger than that. He'll take care of it. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You don't have to fight that battle. That's not yours to fight. Let it go. Let it ride. God will have His vengeance. Everyone reaps what they sow. Everyone reaps what they sow. Everyone reaps what they sow. When you sow evil in darkness, it shall be shouted in the light. When you do dark sins and you think you've gotten away with it, you have not. You have not. Every sin will be exposed. The only way out of judgment is the blood of Christ. The only way to find mercy is the blood of Christ. It's not by you justifying yourself. It's not by you hiding your sin. The only way to salvation is through what Jesus did for you. Gamma male, though did not embrace Christianity, or at least we have no 
full evidence of it. I'm almost certain he didn't because the Jews would have scratched his memory the best they could from the books. They certainly wouldn't have called him Rabban. Boy, he teetered close. You know, in the Sanhedrin, there were a couple others that some of us don't always remember that ended up doing some spectacular things for Jesus. One was Nicodemus. When Jesus was getting buried, Nicodemus was part of the Sanhedrin. He brought thousands of dollars worth of aroma and spices to accompany Jesus in a burial. And where was Jesus buried? He was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Well, guess who Joseph was? A man on the Sanhedrin. So you already got two guys on the Sanhedrin that are dealing with Jesus. They're already wrestling with the thought that Jesus might have been more than what we thought him to be. And so Gamaliel, these are Gamaliel's friends. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they, they're in the same club. They're in the same group. He's the leader of that band. And he knows these guys intimately and closely. And so already we're dealing with three people on the 60. That's 5%. 5% on the 60 are already wrestling with, what about this Jesus guy? And that encourages me because a lot of times we begin to think that the religious uh, group in Jesus' day was, was all bad. But as we continue on in Acts, we're going to find there's going to be a revival very soon. And, the, and there's a very quick verse in Acts that says, many of the priests converted and were baptized. And that's just going to be uh, overwhelming. Amen. There are many, many traditions about these guys and what they uh, possibly did to try to stop what was about to happen to Jesus. And Gamaliel was very familiar with them. In verse 38, he says, Now I say unto you, refrain from these men, leave them alone. And if their counsel or this work is of men, it will come to naught. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily you be found to fight against God. I know each of us in our lives have found ourselves to fight against God. I, I think once in a while you, you, you find that, especially in the realm of sin or things that you want to do selfishly. And you find yourself struggling against God. But these guys were actually trying to do the right thing. In their mind, they were being zealous for truth. And in their zealousness for their understanding of truth, they were going to find themselves fighting against God. In their zealousness of their tradition, of their doctrines, of their understanding of truth, because they were misled, they had not seen the light yet, they were going to find themselves resisting against God. And so it's a little different than resisting based on just a willing sin. It's, it's more of a resistance that comes from being ignorant. Gamaliel dies before he begins to see the full extent of the revival of Christianity. Christianity has exploded. He's going to die 15 to 17 years before the Romans come in to destroy the city. They're going to destroy it in 70 A.D., Gamaliel loses the, 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 the Mishnah, the Talmud speaks of Gamaliel, and he, it says that he has this unruly disciple. Uh, it makes the writings. He's the only rabbi that, that, that makes the writings of, of, of a disciple that, that was so promising that ended up being unruly. Most Christian commentators believe that disciple to be Paul. They believe that, that uh, they went ahead and, and put it in there. And because Paul made such an impact on society from that point on that they, they felt compelled they needed to put it in there. They don't name him. But they do name the behavior of a very smart and promising disciple that they thought was going to be wonderful who turned out to be sour. And so uh, that was probably Paul. And, and, and I, 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 I want you to taste this a little bit for a, a couple reasons. One is because... I want you to realize that seeds planted come in so many different fashions. 
The way you speak and the things you do and the chimneys you fix and the people you counsel and the person you drive for and the comments you make and the letters you write and, and the smile you give can contribute to the whole. So at the very least, don't stop doing that. At the very most, be more bold. So the crowd had to agree. Literally in the Greek, it, co it conveys the idea that they had no choice but to allow Gamaliel to call the shots. And so it says in verse 40, they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should no more speak in the name of Jesus. Gamaliel said had nothing to do with them. He didn't talk about flogging them or beating them. Matter of fact, what they were determined to do was capital punishment. They wanted to kill them. Gamaliel stops the murder and tells them have nothing to do with them. Let God work this one out. And they decide, well, okay, we won't have anything to do with them, but let us take a few pot shots first and beat them a little bit, you know, stick them, stone them, punch them, uh, kick them, whatever we got to do. A a and then they do it again and they tell them, stop talking about Jesus. Mm, 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 stop it. Maybe a broken nose. Maybe broken ribs. And what does the Bible tell us? They departed from the presence of the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they counted it worthy to suffer shame for his name. They're like, thank you, Lord. This is one stripe you didn't have to pay for me on the cross. Thank you, God, as the blood's coming out their nose, maybe. This is one drip of blood, God, that you didn't have to pay for me. I count it a blessing that I'm worthy to be persecuted for your name. They walk away battered and bruised, literally praising God for the persecution. And in verse 42, it says, and daily in the temple, in the temple, daily, right back on the mountain, right back where they started back, back preaching the name of Jesus. They don't even pause for a day. Come on. It's amazing. Right back. It's not about Sunday between 10 and, and noon. It's every day in their face. In their face. 10,000 of them marching up on the hill saying, Our oh, Jesus is Lord. And you got something to reconcile about it. Amen. There's no fear there. There's absolute boldness. Why? Because they've been set free. They've been forgiven. They know it. They know deep down that they were sinners. They were lost. They were judged. They were condemned. But that man, Christ Jesus, had died for them. And there was nothing they would withhold from Him from this point forward. They would surely die if necessary to lift up His name every day in the temple, in public, and in every house, everywhere they went. It was public and it was private. It was in the assembly and it was out of the assembly. It wasn't just in one place. It was everywhere they went. Everywhere they went. They were contagious. They are like a virus. They did not cease to teach and preach Jesus Christ. They weren't preaching a revolution. Not of the sorts that the culture had seen. They weren't camping a lot of time. You know, you, you can read all the Bible and the letters of Paul. You're not going to find a lot of political stuff there. And that's not because there wasn't a lot of political stuff going on. They didn't spend all their time wasting on their current culture. They preached Jesus they preach the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And that's it. That's all that mattered. That caused them enough trouble than getting caught up in worldly affairs. They preach Jesus, not insurrection, not Phariseeism. They preach Jesus above the world's agenda or comfort. I'm building... with these sermons. We're going in order, but I'm building. I'm building towards a picture. I want those of you that hear to see a picture of what church should look like so that you can determine what you should look like. 
And I'm afraid that if we get our picture of what church should look like from this two-hour moment or from our culture's tradition, that you will never be a Christian. Because what a Christian is, is nothing close to what society is teaching us. It's nothing close to what the culture's brought us. And it's amazing what a Christian is as we begin to peer into this book. We are climbing towards, in case you want to know, Rome. We're going to walk through Acts until we get to the Roman church. And the great question I'm going to ask over and over again is what seeds might have been planted to create the Roman church? Because it wasn't started by an apostle. One of the things that Paul's wrestling with in his letter to the Romans is the fact that he's never met them and they've never met an apostle and yet they have an amazing church. So my little question that I'll ask hopefully from here until we get there is what's happening in Rome? Where are these disciples that are beginning to form in Rome coming from? Who are they? How did they get there? And how did they know what to do in church? Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your word. Thank you for examples, even from those who may not have made it, like Gamaliel. God, uh, we, we appreciate the word that you put down for us through Luke and his faithfulness to record the writings for us in Acts. But God, underneath it all, what we desire is to become pleasing to you and closer to you. Whether you define church this way or that way, or early church or late church or tradition, or you get caught up in all the different things we can get up. At the end of the day, God, all we want to do is be the little kid sitting on your knee. We just want to be close to you, Father. We just want to adore you, praise you, have fun, uh, love you, and, and be loved by you. To be welcome in your presence. And so, God, I pray that we will hunger and thirst after righteousness. We'll hunger and thirst for a greater presence of your Holy Spirit within us. I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, we'll be bolder. I pray, God, that you will show us the path to walk on, the direction to go. And I ask these things in the name that's been persecuted over and over and over and over again, in the name that has the power to save, in the name that truly heals. I ask these things in the name of Jesus, even as you spread healing to our own hearts. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.